That worked. Uh, wow. So I, you know, hey everybody, it's great to be here. I'm Ezra. Uh, I'm one of the people in this movement, but. Uh, the, it's incredible being in this role because I find myself traveling all over the country and preaching to the choir a lot, but not often in a church. So this is a real, this is a real treat. Um, I, I uh, uh, have been talking to a lot of people about this crazy thing called Indivisible that started a couple of years ago. Um, and but since the election, since we've been in this new Congress, I actually haven't gone out and spoken to a new group. So y'all are y'all are the first. Um, and I was trying to think out. Yeah, excited to be here. And I might be staying here depending on how the snow goes, so you might have to live with me for a while. Um, I was trying to think about how best to, to talk about what's happened over the next two years, what we're seeing going in the future, and uh, I think the, the real answer is I shouldn't talk too much because this should be a back and forth. This movement is about what y'all are doing, not what's happening in DC. So uh, I'm gonna try to keep this as short as possible so we can make this a back and forth. But I do wanna tell uh, three stories uh, that came to mind when I was up this morning trying to figure out how to frame all this. Um, and the first is, it, it goes back to 2017. We uh, at Indivisible National, we started holding all of these uh, regional convenings, these trainings for groups, and Matt and others, I, I think, have attended these. Um, they're basically like nuts and bolts grassroots trains. How do we organize progressive power wherever you are, whether it's in Indiana or California or New York, doesn't matter. We've held these trains for Indivisible groups. Uh, and I was at one in Columbus in mid-2017, and um, I was scheduled in the morning to go and speak to the uh, indivisible groups uh, early on, the leaders who were leading the training. I got up, and I went downstairs, and there was the, um, the room where the, the training was going to happen, and it, the, the room was labeled uh, the, the Conference of Plasters and Cement Masons. And I thought, that is really smart. Because early on in Indivisible's history, we were really worried that there were going to be like conservative Republican infiltrators. They would try to like film us and, and in some way take us down. And so we were really careful about what we put out there that was public. And I thought, this, this disguise of, of plasters and cement masons is really smart. Because what, what is Indivisible about? But we're, we are the plasters and cement masons of American democracy. We're trying to build something up. And I was considering just the poetry of this disguise when somebody else from Indivisible came up and pointed to this other room that was clearly labeled Indivisible, um, <laughs> where the training was actually happening. But, you know, I, I, I think the point still stands. Like, what we are dealing with right now is not typical American political uh, conflict. We're not discussing the, the size of the social safety net or whether we should expand or shrink Medicare or Medicaid or whether we should uh, increase Social Security. What we're talking about is do we have democracy or do we have something else? That is the question in front of us, and one side is firmly planted uh, on one particular side of that, um, that debate, and it's happening right now. Right now, we have literally the longest government shutdown in American history, uh, and this is not because of Donald Trump. This is because of a system that allows Donald Trump to thrive and assert his power the way he does. And that, that's what's behind Indivisible. This, I, that, this idea that Donald Trump doesn't care what we think. When we wrote the guide originally, it recognized that hard truth. He did a lot of damage on his own. And that's, wh that's who he is. The question is whether we have elected officials who stand up or just rubber stamp him. And so what we have right now is this crisis in American democracy where, yes, Donald Trump is a buffoon and he's vicious and he's cruel and he's trying to do the worst, but we also have a Congress that is often unwilling to stand up to him. Yeah. Now, this isn't, this isn't an accident. This, isn't, um, this is, again, not just Donald Trump. This is a long time coming. A healthy democratic body would have rejected Trump the same way a healthy body rejects a virus. And the reason why it didn't happen is not because Donald Trump is just so bad, it's because folks who are currently in power recognize that our democracy is diversifying. They recognize that their policies are unpopular. They, rep they recognize that if they push forward a plutocratic white supremacist policy agenda, the mass majority of Americans are going to reject that. So their solution is to make the democracy less representative. Their solution is to voter, uh, purge voters. It's to gerrymander districts. It's to allow our elections to be hijacked by foreign powers. That's what they're doing. And Indivisible is not about one candidate. It's not about one issue. It's based on the fundamental radical idea that in a representative democracy, your representatives ought to represent you. That's what that's about. That's what we're doing here. Um, so th thanks for being part of this. Um, 
And that, that all sounds nice, right? That, those are uh, nice words, but we're in Indiana. And I've said those things in Tennessee. I'm from Texas, uh, was in Georgia, was in Tallahassee and Daytona talking about these same things. And one of the reasons why I was excited to come out here is because I don't think you save American democracy just by organizing in New York and California and city centers. This is not going to work if we just forget large swaths of the country. Yeah. And so, this, this is the second story I want to talk about. Um, uh, I don't know if y'all remember back, gosh, it feels like decades ago. Uh, this is back in the spring of 2017. Um, I know, right? Spring of 2017. We were all so young then. Uh, <laughs> But there was this special election race uh, in Georgia 6. John Ossoff was running. And I will tell you, that race, we had our, just, our hearts were totally in that race. We, we had heard from everybody, look, the resistance, what, you know, it's going to be gone in a few weeks. And surely, it can't electoralize. They're going to get through repeal of the Affordable Care Act, and they're going to go through a, a whole bunch of stuff. You're not going to stop them. And we thought this was the chance. We thought, no, you don't, you don't see what we're seeing on the ground. What we're seeing are people who have not been politically active before. Maybe they have been, but they've lapsed. But now they're getting engaged. They're actually they're, they're registering voters. They're talking to folks. We are going to win this thing, and you're going to be surprised. We're going to flip Newt Gingrich's seat. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, that, that's where we were. we were. We were ready to go. We had a New York Times op-ed written about how the new blue wave was coming. And this was proof it was going to happen. And then, do y'all know what happened in the Georgia 6 race in 2017? We lost. We lost bad. We lost worse than Clinton lost in that district, actually. Um, and that night, Lee and I, my wife, she's the, the co-executive director of Indivisible with me, uh, we, we tried to put on a brave face. We called down. There were a handful of Indivisible groups in their head who had similarly put their hearts and souls into this, into this race. And we called down, and we wanted to tell them, look, we understand it's tough. We understand it's a tough district, but you did the work, and this is, you know, this is a long battle, and you know, don't lose hope. There's still hope. We, we just need to keep on working. Um, and we called down. We got to them. They were in a very raucous bar. Um, and they were elated. They were absolutely elated. They said, oh my gosh, this was, he wasn't a great candidate anyway. We didn't think he was going to win. But now everybody's paying attention. And we got more people involved. And we're going to build. And there's this state senate race coming up. And we've got to worry about what's happening in the state legislature. So we're going to be working on that. And you can bet your butt that we're going to be holding our new Republican representative accountable immediately. And it was incredible. It was an incredible feeling because we called there to, to cheer them up and then we just left just feeling like this was something real and permanent that these folks were building on the ground. Uh, and when I, when I used to tell that story uh, in 2017 and into mid-2018, I'd tell that story. That was the end of it. I'd say, like, isn't this great what these folks in red rural areas even are doing to try to rebuild democracy? But that, that's actually not where the story ends in Georgia 6. Because what happened in Georgia 6, what happened with those indivisible groups, is they did exactly what they said. They started fighting at the state legislative level. They started fighting on other local election level. And they started holding this new terrible Republican member of Congress accountable repeatedly, event after event, pressure after pressure, earned media like y'all are getting after a piece of earned media. Uh, they held a candidate for him for the Democratic primary to see who they were going to endorse. They got behind a candidate to endorse. And you know what happened on November 6th? They flipped the seat blue. There is a Democratic representative in Georgia 6. Which is just to say, look, y'all, I know it is tough. I know that the state of progressive infrastructure in this country, in many parts of the country, is paltry. We are building from ground zero in many places. And these victories aren't going to be immediate victories. We're not necessarily going to win in the first election we compete in or the fourth election we're going to compete in. But the way we win is by staying engaged. The way we win is not by treating elections as something that occurs every two years, but elections begin the day after election day. That's how we win. So that's how we're going to keep winning in Indiana, too. So this is what gives me hope, seeing everybody come out here despite, despite everything, both immediately out there and immediately and not immediately out there in the whole political climate. Y'all coming out here really does give me hope. Um, and so I want to just end, I, I know I, I said I wasn't going to speak that long, but nobody's stopping me. Um, uh, I want to end just the last thing, uh, reflecting on like the last two years. Um, so two plus years ago now, Lee and I were in our living room 
feeling lost and alone and grasping for answers of what might be, what we can do in this dark and dangerous time. Uh, and the one silver lining in that moment, the one thing that we saw that was giving us hope was that we saw new people getting engaged. And we saw them trying to figure out ways to make their, their elected officials listen. And so we thought this, the small thing we could do in that moment was describe how that might work. Say, here is what makes your elected officials tick. Here's the role of constituent power in American democracy. Go off, hopefully this is useful. That's why we wrote the Indivisible Guide. That was our only aspiration. Uh, when we originally released the guide as a Google Doc, I, I tweeted it out to my you know, dozens of followers on Twitter. Um, and it, I mean, it took off, it went viral and whatever. Vi documents go viral all the time, but uh, the, the significant part for this story is, uh, it went viral in that moment and Google Docs started crashing. Uh, too many people were trying to access it. You couldn't download or print the document, which we thought was incredible. Like, I mean, 23 pages on saving American democracy and people are like actually reading it was cool. Um, but, but then, so two years later, the, the election has happened, the midterms have happened. We've retaken 40 seats in the House of Representatives, nearly 40, uh, 400 state legislative seats, six new Democratic trifectas, seven new Democratic governors. Thank you, yeah. And, and a week after the election to the day, we release a new guide, which is indivisible on offense. This new guide is about what we do in this new moment in national politics where we're no longer fully in the minority, but there is a Democratic House of Representatives. What are the powers that come with that? How can you use constituent power starting in January 2019 to make them use that power that they've got? Um, and we, we released it that Tuesday. I went on Matta that night, and we crashed that Google Doc, too. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it was so, it was so hardening because again, this movement is not about getting a Democrat elected in a, in a state house race or in a Senate race or in, a, in, in any particular election. This movement is about whether we have democracy or something else. And the answer to that question is gonna be whether you all are mobilizing the way that you're mobilizing here, whether you're organizing the way you're organizing here. And um, so I want you to know whether your candidate won or lost, whether your specific issue was defeated or passed, you are part of this big broader movement. I've been traveling around the country. There are indivisible groups literally in every single congressional district in the country. Doesn't matter how red, doesn't matter how blue, doesn't matter how purple. You're part of this big nationwide thing. Um, and this big nationwide thing is building power that is asserting itself in Washington now. So the other thing that happened a week after the election is actually just five or six days after the election is Indivisible co-hosted with the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center the first ever new training for progressive members of Congress. This was Indivisible National and the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. We had folks like Angie Craig and Andy Kim and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ayanna Presley and Ilhan Omar, all of these new members in a room together learning how you hire staff and what the resistance cares about and what kind of orientation they want their members of Congress to take. And this is Indivisible, which was a Google Doc in our living room two years ago, now training these new members. That's not because we're some kind of magical uh, leaders of this movement. It's because of the work y'all are doing on the ground that makes this real. Every single victory we've had, every ounce of power we've built, you own, you are part of that. We have in our offices a list of principles for us organizationally, and there are 10 of them. At the very, very top of it is we work for the leaders of this movement. This will never work if it is command and control. If I'm coming in here and saying, here's what Greater Lafayette Indivisible needs to be doing. This is gonna work because y'all are organizing and telling us what you need. So now I'm gonna shut up because I wanna hear what you need. I wanna hear what you're seeing. I wanna learn from you and I wanna keep on building together so we can save American democracy and have some fun while we do it. So thanks y'all for having me out. How do, people can just raise their hands and I'll repeat questions if you want. Our newly elected Democratic official here. I'm Chris Campbell, newly elected. Yeah, uh, great, great question. I'm gonna, so I'll answer that specifically and then broaden it. So what, what she's talking about is this, this effort to make the uh, Electoral College irrelevant. And it's actually possible to do without a constitutional amendment. There's this cool trick um, where if enough states pass a state law, this happens within states, enough states pass a state law that says whichever presidential candidate wins the popular vote gets our electoral votes, 
then the Electoral College effectively doesn't matter. So if you get 270 electoral votes or 271 electoral votes worth of states to pass that law, then the Electoral College is irrelevant. It means that if Maine, uh, if a Republican wins Maine, um, but a Democrat wins the popular vote, Maine still sends its electoral votes to uh, the presidential candidate who won the popular vote. Uh, so that is an active effort that's underway. Several states have already passed it. There electoral votes away from doing it and I know of an effort in Colorado right now that our organizer there is working on with the local indivisible groups so yes that is happening endorse it it's a good idea the electoral college is a is a nasty vestige of slavery and a, a terrible system that has been set up to deny the will of the people I would say it's not just the electoral college that's the problem so we surveyed indivisible groups leading into this Congress um, asking what are the issues that that you think Congress should prioritize? What are the fundamental things that we should first work on? And indivisible groups, as you might expect, care about a lot of things. We care about uh, uh, taxes. We care about reproductive justice. We care about immigrant rights. We care about the environment and gun safety, et cetera. Everything under the sun, everybody's very engaged. But at the very, very top of the list was this fundamental concern for the basic institutions of democracy. And yes, it's the Electoral College, but it's also gerrymandering and voting rights and election security and transparency and lobbying reform. We are not going to have any of the nice things we want, whether it's social or economic reforms, if we have a 19th century democracy. And that's what we've got right now. So what we would like to see is leadership at the state level where it is possible now. Let's push forward good bills. Like I said, there are six new Democratic trifecta states. They should be leading what American democracy ought to look like. And that we're seeing that happen in, in New York. We're seeing that happen in Colorado. We're seeing movement in California. They should be showing what is possible at the state level. But also, you might have heard there's a presidential campaign that's starting to heat up. I would like to hear from our leaders what is their big, bold vision for 21st century American democracy. I want to see them out-democracy each other. So in the same way that in 2007 we saw Edwards and Hillary and Obama say, this is my health care plan, no, this is my health care plan, no, this is my health care plan, this is why it's the best. We need a similar platform from these candidates and telling us, what are, what are you going to do for American democracy? Yes, Electoral College is a piece of it, but it's so much more than that. Uh, and I think there's a big opportunity right now, in no small part because of the work that you are doing and individuals across the country, making this a political possibility. It makes it attractive. It makes it possible that these candidates can distinguish themselves based on fighting for democratic reforms. And it's not just Democrats. There's no reason this needs to be just Democratic Party politics. Congressional Republicans have chosen a side here, but we saw in Florida literally the largest enfranchisement of citizens since the Civil Rights Act just passed by 60 plus percent. This is reenfranchising uh, re returning citizens. Um, it's incredible. This passed in Florida the same election that Democrats lost the Senate and lost the governor's race, but that passed. Democracy is popular, but elected officials will embrace it if we tell them we're looking for them to embrace it. So I'm very excited for what can be accomplished at the state level and the federal level in the next two and three years. So when you are doing, yes, so it's a great question. And just to repeat the question, the question is, what, what are best practices in kind of leaning red, conservative areas, rural areas, whatever it might be? Not, uh, there, there's a categorical difference between um, organizing Indivisible in San Francisco, which literally had to have a wait list for getting into meetings because too many people are trying to, to get there, and organizing in East Tennessee or in Arkansas or in, or in Daytona or somewhere, somewhere else. Um, and so one of the key things you're doing right here, which is meeting in person, this is not an online movement. This is a movement of people building actual community together. And so seeing everything that y'all have done through these videos, seeing everything that you're doing to pull in new people and form partnerships with folks on the ground, that's absolutely key. I will say I've seen some of the strongest indivisible groups in these red areas because uh, there's this phenomenon, maybe this happened to people in the room, there's this phenomenon of people who are progressives or people who don't like Trump who uh, uh, live in red areas think that they're alone. Even though 20, 30, 40 percent of the population is with them, they think they're alone. I was uh, with indivisible groups in, um, uh, in Beaumont, Texas. Uh, and we were knocking on doors for Beto, who was endorsed by Indivisible after the locals endorsed Beto. And I knocked on this line of doors with an Indivisible group leader, and every single one of them said, absolutely for Beto. He had, he had huge support in the area. 
And the last uh, door I knocked on was this woman, and I told her I was with the local Indivisible group, came to see me for a bedo, and she like ushered me in her 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 uh, house, and she said. I'm for Beto, but don't tell anybody in here, uh, in this neighborhood, because they are all Ted Cruz supporters. <laughs> and I think there is this radical act in red areas of just being visible, just saying, hey, no, it is normal and rational that we should be opposed to this president's policies or this state legislature's policies, uh, and join us, be part of the solution. I don't think Indiana is a red state, it's a non-voting state. Nearly half of your citizens didn't vote. <laughs> There, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing conservative about robbing communities of color and young people of their vote. There's nothing conservative about saying that elected officials ought to be able to choose their voters versus voters choosing their electeds. There's nothing conservative about saying that we ought to give massive tax cuts to corporations and drive up deficits. There's no reason why Indiana shouldn't be agreeing with you, and you have the ability to make that argument. Uh, so I think being visible, having physical spaces where people are coming together on a regular basis, figuring out how to get media attracted, media attention is very key. So showing that you disagree is a good way to get media and that's a good way to advertise uh, what you're doing. Um, uh, but based on the videos that I'm seeing, you're doing a lot of that already. Uh, I would also just connect with other indivisible groups in other areas that are similar. It doesn't have to just be in Indiana, although that, that's useful. Talk to the East Tennessee indivisible groups. Talk to the, the indivis indivisible groups in Louisiana. Um, that's possible. That's one of the reasons of being part of a national network um, is you can learn from each other. Yeah, uh, great, great point. So uh, the gentleman's talking about this uh, relatively new book came out earlier or last year called Democracy in Chains by a, a Duke professor, Nancy McLean. Uh, we've talked with her a lot. She's come over to the office. Um, we've coordinated on, on some work. Um, and the basic argument that she makes is related to what I was saying earlier, and by no small part because we were influenced heavily by her, um, that there was a recognition in the arch-conservative libertarian movement in mid-century that their policies were not popular and that the number one threat to their ability to achieve uh, e extremely low tax rates for corporations and rich people and extremely small government except in so far as it protects their property, the number one threat was popular will. Um, and so the solution to that problem is setting up think tanks, setting up advocacy organizations, and planting ideas around constraining democracy, putting it in chains so that you can achieve the policy ends that you want. Um, and we see that happening in, uh, in elected officials' actions just about every single day now, it's not just Trump. He did not invent this. Some of the most egregious attacks on democracy have come in North Carolina or Wisconsin or in Georgia or in Texas. These are places where they are actively purging voters because they recognize if those voters vote, then they don't get their way. Um, the other good book that I'd recommend if you're looking at thinking about the basic democracy issue that we're facing here is How Democracies Die. There's a book that came out, uh, I believe, in late 2017, um, which gives a good historical analysis comparing how democracies like ours that have presidential and um, uh, bicameral legislative systems, how breaking down of norms, increasing of polarization um, can lead to democracy is dissolving and dying, uh, and what possible solutions could be to fix that. The short version, if you don't want to w read 300 pages, is uh, they recommend a broad-based popular movement in support of democracy. They think that's the only thing that can work. So let's do that. <laughs> uh, way in the back. Oh, and then Matt. Yeah. Oh, you have a reading list in democracy? Yes. Great. Okay. Oh, I have a lot of other. Uh, uh, Twitter and tear gas is also great by Zineb Tefekshi. Highly recommend that. Uh, Twitter and tear gas by Zineb Tefekshi. And then the other one that I'd recommend uh, is uh, This is an Uprising. Twitter and Tear Gas and This is an Uprising are both great books just about organizing uh, and people power, which maybe sounds kind of boring, but they, they talk about it in a historical context and in a, uh, in a multinational context that's uh, just real t page turners and very informative. So I absolutely want to see that grow because I think it is, so two things, I think it is incredibly important for this movement to be locally driven. It's important that a neighborhood can set up an indivisible group, right, and lead. But people power is a numbers game. 
in order to best affect the change that we want to see, we've got to coordinate all around districts, around states, and nationally. This is Indivisible National exists to help us coordinate nationally, but we need state-level coordinating structures. And these are naturally starting to pop up all over the country. Um, we have different examples, and Marcus would be really, really good to talk to because um, we can connect you to some of the, the training staff that we have on board who are working on this actively. But the, uh, a good way to start this, and I know you all are already doing some of this, but a good way to start this is don't you don't even need to start with what is our coordinating structure going to be. You start with a project that is statewide. Like there can be a, a statewide indivisible Indiana, maybe it's a, a letter in support of legislation or an action of some sort, some way that you're working together and building relationships. Because as soon as you start building structures of governance, you need, you need relationships and trust between people to understand exactly how that's going to play out. The best way to build that is on working on stuff together. Uh, so I think that is a first immediate step, but it would take a long time. But uh, I highly recommend talk to Marcus because he can walk through what we're seeing in New Mexico or Iowa or California or Massachusetts. There are these statewide networks of indivisible groups that th there's not just one way to skin the cat here. You can do it a few different ways. Uh, we're pro Green New Deal. Uh, I, I think Green New Deal is a great idea. We're, uh, I think, fundamentally the the. Uh, so the question was about Green New Deal, which is this proposal, which has been around for a while, but it has a a, a new. Um, life breathed into it by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Sunrise Movement and others who are organizing in favor of it. I think the thing that we would like to see overall, I would just to, to make it broader than the Green New Deal, I think we should be talking about what 21st century democracy and social and economic reforms ought to look like. We need to recognize at the national level, we have the House of Representatives, and that's huge. That gives us a lot of power right now. It's power that we didn't have. It does not give us power to unilaterally pass laws. We don't have the Senate, we don't have the presidency. Mitch McConnell will never, ever, if he has the power, uh, bring up Green New Deal or Medicare for All or major democracy reform or you name it. He'll never bring it up for a vote. Not going to happen. Um, but I think we're going to take the Senate and the presidency in 2020. I, I, I don't think Mitch McConnell is going to be Senate Majority Leader in 2021. And so then the question is, what bills do get brought up for a vote in 2021? And the, and the answer is, it's the bills we're talking about now. So if you care about Green New Deal, if you care about democracy reform, if you care about Medicare for all, I, if you care about, it doesn't matter, whatever issue you care about, if Congress isn't talking about it now, when there is a unified Democratic Congress and President in 2021, it's not getting done. So that's why it's important to stay engaged now. We are deciding what 2020 federal policy is going to be right now. Um, and so what the, it's worth talking a little bit about the Indivisible and Offense Guide which talks about this new power that we have through the House of Representatives. Because the Democrats control the House of Representatives, they can call these things up for a vote. They can have hearings on these things. They can actually discuss these issues and, and craft what is going to be the Democratic platform. Um, so using these next two years, we're no longer just playing defense. This is the exciting thing. We can actually go on offense and start having these fights. What, what is our priority in 2021? We should hammer that out now. Right. No, I, it is a really great point. So when we released the Indivisible and Offense Guide, which is explicitly about federal advocacy now that there's a Democratic House, at the same time we released this new guide, Indivisible on States. And I think the one, one thing that uh, we did when we were writing the original guide two years ago is we were explicitly just focused on Congress. That's what we knew. That's, that's, that's where we worked. We understood how it worked. But the basic idea behind Indivisible that you can scare the hell out of your elected official because they're looking to run for re-election. That applies at all levels. That applies at the city council level, that applies at the state senate level or state house level. And a lot of the work that can be done, especially in red states, is not going to be at the federal level. It'll be at the state and local level. And that's fine. That's good. you got to start there, build up your bench of people who are doing good advocacy work, get them elected, and then get them elected to higher office. It's not, it's not rocket science. So in, in, uh, in a state like Indiana where Yes, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening nationally, but your senators are god awful, your representative is a Trump Trumpite, and they don't listen to you. Call them, but you can focus your energies elsewhere too to actually affect good change in the immediate term. And I think you're making a good point about marches are nice, but then what? And the Twitter and Tear Gas book is really good on this too by Zineb Tefekshi. She makes this point. There was a there's a time in American history where having a massive march 
was a symbol of power. It meant that you had the institutional structure necessary to put all that together. And that's tough to do. How do you get 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 people out? You can't do that just like that, right? Well, you can now. You can do that with Twitter. Like, it's possible to like suddenly get a flash mob out. And if, if what we are doing is constantly marching and yelling and then the energy dissolves, the institutional power, they're just gonna stay there. They will take that. They are happy to be yelled at and then go on about their jobs and get reelected or get elected again. I think that is a great point. So you gotta dig in and keep building this power and then applying it and staying, staying engaged. So one of the things that made me encouraged here and it's made me encouraged elsewhere is that what we didn't see the day after the election is everybody say, ugh, oh, we did it, now let's go home. The number one question I got from indivisible groups when I was calling around after the election was, okay, what's next? And I think that it, that is the right question to ask. Our goal, again, is not to elect one specific official. It's not to put one march together. It's to change what's politically possible in the country. And so we have some responsibility to think, what is effective? Is the march affecting the change that we want to see? Or do we need to really get to know this committee member who's on this spot and then put pressure in that way? We've got to think smart about how we're applying that power so we actually affect that change. One immediate leverage point that we talked about with some people earlier is breaking the supermajority that they've got in the state legislature. That's not going to solve all your problems, but that's one step in the right direction. So thinking thoughtfully about what is the strategy to get there, realistically, how are you going to do that? Create a plan and then carry that plan out over the next two years. Then you'll be in a different political position. Then you'll go for breaking their majority. Then you'll go for building up advocacy power to actually push through what you want. I think that all that's necessary. This isn't a movement of marching. We're not here because we want to see ourselves on TV. We're here because we want to affect change. No. Yeah, more, more power to you. There's, so I actually think medical marijuana has wide support, including bipartisan support. It's not, I mean, we see support for that even in Texas that, that crosses party lines. I, I do think the issue, like, we all are going to have issues that we want to get done. Um, the question isn't what is the specific issue we want to get done, it's gonna, how are we going to do it? There's a good story about FDR, he just got, just got elected, it's 1933, it's April, when a major labor leader comes into his office, helped him get elected, big ally, and he says, sir, really excited for you to be in office, now I want you to do this thing, it's re related to labor legislation. FDR says, totally agree, now make me do it. <laughs> the, that, that is the role of movements like this. The reason why we are not an arm of the Democratic Party is because we need to be able to be able to put pressure on our elected officials and the Democratic Party to do what we want, or the Republican Party, or whatever party you've got in there. Our role is to say, we expect you to do this, even if you agree with us, we gotta make them do it. So if you wanna get medical marijuana through, more power to you, make them do it. And the answer to that is organizing and putting pressure in the places where you gotta put pressure. Yeah, uh, 100%. And, you know, I think that the way that you achieve progressive policy change is twofold. You get a majority, and then you ensure that majority wants to get done what you want it to get done. That's, that's it. Uh, and so how do you do that? Uh, there are primaries and there are general elections. That's how you do it. You engage in primaries, and you ensure that your elected officials, whoever's winning the primaries, reflect your values. And then regardless of who wins the primaries, you've got to rally around them, because if you don't retake power, none of it matters. So we can't, uh, one, one saying that we have um, um, in, uh, at Indivisible when we're talking about the primary and the general elections is sainthood doesn't scale. Now it's all well and good for us to have the policies and the ideology that we personally support and we want to see folks in the primary uh, support those policies as, as well. But you know, when, you, when you're running a candidate like um, in Lipinski's district in Illinois, and Marie Newman uh, is a Democrat challenging him in the primary. She lost, it was a shame. A lot of the progressive groups were behind her. She lost. Lipinski's opponent was a literal neo-Nazi. It's not a hard choice between a mediocre Democrat and, and a literal neo-Nazi. Like, that's not tough. Uh, you still gotta rally around the winner. But if you, if you care about what policies the elected Democrats are gonna hold, you gotta engage them at that stage in the process, in the primary process. The reason why things like Green New Deal and a 70% tax rate on 10, million dollars and above is on the table is because a moderate Democrat got primaried by a more conservative or more that's not going to work everywhere Indiana it might not make sense here I'm not saying Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez ought to, ought to represent Indiana she sh she should if y'all support her but maybe somebody else should y'all could be key to getting us a majority um, so 
the, the, the easy answer is you got to just engage at every step of the process. The way you engage is going to be different depending on what step of the process it is. But I do think primaries can be healthy for this, uh, for this purpose. Um, we should treat primaries like a, a good opportunity to debate what the future of the Democratic Party ought to be because that's what they are. Um, and then whoever wins ought to get the support. And is, is that Vida? Yeah, so I, I did VITA for several years actually. My background's in domestic anti-poverty advocacy and did a lot of tax work too. Uh, VITA is a great program. It's basically helping low-income people file their taxes, which is actually really fun. It's one of the best volunteer activities I've engaged in other than Indivisible. Because you get like a long discussion with somebody about their history and you kind of get to know them. Uh, but on ranked choice voting, I think it's great. Maine literally just voted it in. Um, especially, um, so are folks familiar with how ranked choice voting works? So instead of just choosing who your top choice is, and maybe your top choice wins, maybe they don't, you, you actually get to rank. You get to say who your top choice is, your second, your third. And so if your top choice doesn't get, say, 10 or 15 percent of the vote, then, all, then your vote goes to your second choice. And then that's how you, that, that means you don't face this problem of having like a spoiler candidate. Um, so if, you're, you know, if your top choice is the Joe Bob party, you can vote Joe Bob party, but if Joe Bob party doesn't get 10% um, of the vote, then your vote goes to the Democratic party or the Green party or the Libertarian party, whatever it might be. Um, so that, that is stuff, uh, that, that's reform that can be done at the federal level, at the state level, at the municipal level. Um, we've seen it, uh, proposals at the federal level and actual reforms enacted at the state and local level. Um, again, uh, this is a good way to make democracy more reflect the will of the people. It's a good way to give people choices. Um, it just takes uh, a fair amount of organizing to get it done because the folks who don't like it are elected officials who stand to lose as a result of ranked choice voting. It's a way to help uh, break the two party system. Yeah. One or two. One or two. No, 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 we're good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We answered all the questions. Democracy is saved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, one, one more. Okay, now we'll save democracy. Million and a half to two million. There are uh, 5,000 groups, again, in every congressional district. Some congressional districts have multiple groups. Um, some in the groups vary greatly in, in size and focus, ranging from a dozen people who are a, a book club to, you know, indivisible East Tennessee has hundreds of people and kind of owns the local party there. Um, San Francisco is thousands, Seattle is thousands. Um, yeah, so they're, 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 they're all over, um, well distributed, and they're leading this. I mean, one thing that is key to this movement is it not become like the Tea Party. And by that I mean it doesn't get taken over by corporations and billionaires to affect their goals. You're never going to see me or somebody else from in Indivisible National come in and say, okay, Indiana Indivisibles, you got to get behind this candidate or you got to get behind this policy because that's what Indivisibles are doing. Um, it's this balance of we try to help coordinate, we provide strategic advice, we do training, um, but fundamentally where the rubber hits the road is up to the folks on the ground. And I think that's what's allowed it to thrive. If you Google image search Indivisible logo, you'll see our logo, you'll also see literally hundreds of logos from all across the country of folks who are owning their Indivisible group, and, that, and that, we're dedicated to that. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, this is great.